and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, before I get started, I have this disclaimer that I don't necessarily have to read out loud, but I do have to highlight. Uh, basically, if you have any questions about this paper, you should direct them to myself or Tad Howe. Don't ask any of the commissioners, they haven't read it. Uh, okay, so we have uh, various business models in the content creation market. Uh, and in this paper, we're going to classify these business models into three broad categories. The first category that we're thinking about is discovery mode. Uh, so this is going to be uh, exemplified by platforms like Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, or Twitter. Uh, the main function, the way these platforms add value, is by facilitating content discovery. Um, and then they make money by generating ad revenue. The next category that we're thinking about is membership platforms or membership mode. Uh, and so this would be platforms like Patreon, Subbable, or Substack. Um, and there's some argument as to whether this really has cross-script network externalities, but I'm going to use the term platform because changing terms is difficult and uh, I'm lazy. <coughs> Um, so these membership platforms are providing infrastructure for creators to directly monetize viewers. Um, so you can think of it as kind of like Shopify for content creators. So uh, they are making it easy for uh, consumers to give direct donations to content creators, which is the model of Patreon. And then they make money by taking a commission on that revenue. And importantly, uh, these two modes are not mutually exclusive. So our third category is hybrid mode, which would be exemplified by platforms like Twitch or TikTok. Uh, so these both have, have both a discovery component where they are helping consumers find content creators and a membership component where they're facilitating this direct value transfer. Uh, and one of the reasons that this hybrid mode is important is that a lot of platforms are switching toward operating in hybrid mode. So uh, examples of platforms that are going from discovery mode to hybrid mode would be YouTube, which launched channel membership in 2018, uh, Facebook, which launched what they call creator membership. Um, and in 2021, Twitter introduced something that they call super follows, which is basically just the same idea as channel membership or creator membership, where you're paying a monthly fee to get extra content. Um, and some of the reasoning behind this is that they felt they were in danger of becoming a promotional tool for Substack writers and Clubhouse creators. So they were aware of the role they were playing in facilitating content discovery, but they wanted some ability to capture some of the direct value transfer from consumers to creators. Um, and then there are also some examples of platforms that have gone from uh, membership mode to hybrid mode. So Teachable, Playbook, and uh, also OnlyFans have started to include some discovery components uh, in uh, their platforms. And so our questions for this paper are, what are the trade-offs between these three platform business models? What are the implications for content design decisions by creators? And how do the trade-offs change when there are multiple platforms? Uh, and in particular, uh, this shift towards operating in hybrid mode is not universal. So Patreon has uh, specifically not uh, shifted towards hybrid mode. And so we want to explore what is driving this coexistence of different business modes. A uh, quick preview of results. Uh, so for uh, our Monopoly platform benchmark, uh, we compare uh, peer discovery versus hybrid, and we find that that leads to more platform profit and more production of niche content. Uh, peer membership versus hybrid uh, has a ambiguous effect on profit and content design. And it's really going to depend on the amount of advertising revenue that is available to a monopoly platform. If they get a lot of revenue, then it's going to give different results than if you have very little revenue. Uh, and then our main result that I'm going to highlight here for having multiple platforms is that in equilibrium, you end up with strategic business model differentiation in order to avoid direct competition. 
Uh, so again, starting with our monopoly benchmark, uh, we're, we have a monopoly platform, a continuum of content creators, and a continuum of consumers, each with unit demand. Uh, and while I'm describing the content creators and consumers, I'm going to suppose that the platform is inactive because this is going to form the outside option for consumers and creators. And the, their decision-making with the platform active is gonna be roughly similar. Uh, so for consumers, uh, consumers engage in uh, Walensky style sequential search for creators uh, where each search costs S zero. Uh, and so if consumer J inspects creator I, there's gonna be a probability lambda I that there is a match in taste between that creator and that consumer. In which case the consumer's utility from becoming a viewer of that creator is going to be a consumer specific utility for public content. Uh, and with probability beta J, uh, they are also going to like that creator's exclusive content. Uh, and so the exclusive content has a value VI and then the creator charges a price PI to access that exclusive content. And if PI is greater than VI, then consumers are never gonna buy. Uh, importantly, this beta is price independent. Uh, so you can think of this as just uh, the probability that uh, I like the uh, exclusive content given the price. Um, and with one probability one minus lambda, there's going to be a mismatch in tastes, in which case the utility from becoming a viewer is zero. Uh, this B sub J and beta J are gonna be independently realized. Um, and we're going to denote by beta naught uh, the expectation of beta J. Creators are gonna be ex ante symmetric. Uh, each creator is going to choose a design, which is this lambda probability, the likelihood for match and taste. And importantly, the consumer's willingness to pay for exclusive content, V, is going to be a function of lambda, which is a decreasing and differentiable function. Uh, so the interpretation here is that a higher lambda is a broader design. So you're gonna have consumers more likely to like that content, but the amount that they like that content, if they like it, is gonna be less. Um, this is in the spirit of Johnson and Myatt's uh, broad niche uh, trade-off. Um, and uh, it's important to remember this, this is gonna be one of the fundamental uh, trade-offs in the paper for content design. Um, Creator I's per viewer revenue is going to be A naught, uh, which is the ad or sponsorship revenue that a creator is able to get on their own, plus any intrinsic utility that they get from creating content, plus their expected uh, exclusive content revenue. Now allowing the platform to be active, the platform can operate one or both of the following. So if they operate a discovery portal, uh, this is going to be facilitating content discovery. It's going to lower consumer search cost to S uh, and at each step of consumer search, it's going to recommend a creator to consumers. And the way we're modeling this recommendation process is as a telecontest. contest. So the probability that creator I is recommended is uh, lambda I, this match probability, taken to the power R, divided by the sum of all of the match probabilities on the discovery portal, also taken to the power R. And R here is uh, the recommendation sensitivity of the platform. So if R increases, then it becomes more sensitive to the broadness of the content. It's going to be more likely to recommend a creator with a higher lambda. And as R decreases, that gets closer to becoming random matching. Uh, a discovery portal is going to generate per viewer ad revenue, A for the platform, so capital A. And it's going to raise creators ad revenue to A bar, which is gonna be greater than A naught. Uh, and the reason that these two are separate is that the creator's ad revenue might be separate and untaxable, but from, uh, from the point of view of the platform. So this could be something like uh, third-party sponsorship deals. 
uh, a membership portal is going to increase the average likelihood that each consumer is interested in accessing exclusive content to beta bar. Uh, so you can think of this as the membership portal is making it easier for content creators to uh, distribute exclusive content. It's gonna provide a uh, set framework for distributing exclusive content. It's gonna make it easier for consumers to like exclusive content. And then it's going to charge a transaction commission tau on creators exclusive content ribbon. Uh, and I just want to take a moment to highlight why we're thinking about the recommendations as a contest. So creators often complain of having to chase the algorithm. Uh, so we know recommendation algorithms generally prioritize content which maximizes engagement which means that there's gonna be a indirect competition in content design, but the chance of succeeding at that contest to get a recommendation is gonna be stochastic from the point of view of creators because the design of the algorithm is otherwise pretty opaque. So we have this effort dedicated to winning a prize, this recommendation, plus a stochastic victory probability, which sounded a lot to us like a contest, and then if you're working with a contest, uh, TOEIC contests are tractable. The timing of the model starts with the platform choosing its modes of operation. Uh, sorry, mode of operation. Um, it only chooses one at a time. Uh, P sets its recommendation design R if it is, operates a discovery portal, it's transaction commission tau if it operates a membership portal or both if it's operating in hybrid mode. Uh, creators are going to make unbundled participation decisions. So unbundled here means that if you have a hybrid platform, they can participate in the discovery portal or the membership portal or both or neither if they want. Um, and they're going to choose their content design and set the exclusive content price. Consumers are going to observe the platform's decisions, but they're not going to observe the decisions of individual creators. And then they're going to choose whether to search and whether to search on a discovery portal if it's being operated or on their own. And the solution concept we're going for is perfect Bayesian equilibrium with symmetric strategies by creators. So for the consumer creator sub game, we're going to focus on hybrid mode because the sub game with a pure discovery platform or a pure membership platform is going to be equivalent with either the commission or uh, the uh, recommendation sensitivity determined exogenously. Uh, so it's just going to change some of the parameters. Uh, so in the equilibrium of the uh, hybrid uh, mode platform, each creator I is going to join the platform. They're going to set their design to maximize this function. And they're going to set their exclusive content price equal to the value of their exclusive content. Uh, each consumer is going to believe that creators are adopting this symmetric strategy and they're going to initiate search if their utility for public content times the probability they like it is greater than the cost of a search. Uh, and optimally, they're going to follow the platform's recommendation at every step uh, because they are being led towards content they're more likely to like. And they're going to search through the platform until they find a positive match. And given this condition, the mass of searchers is going to be the probability that the utility for exclusive content is greater than S divided by lambda, which for notational convenience, we're going to denote by G of lambda over S. So the reasoning for this equilibrium is that each creator's profit is going to be proportional to creator to consumer participation times the probability of being recommended times the probability of a taste match times their margin. And because each creator is part of a continuum, uh, they can't affect this denominator or consumer participation. So their design is going to be equivalent to maximizing this times this times this 
which is this function. And then V is homogenous across consumers, which is going to imply full value extraction or pH equal to V. Uh, so with the hybrid mode, we're gonna end up with a design that is uh, maximize, the argument maximizing this function and this mass, mass of searchers. If we compare that to a pure discovery platform, uh, the main difference when it comes to design is going to be the fact that creators are having to monetize exclusive content on their own. So rather than having a uh, commission, a revenue uh, with some tax by the platform, they have uh, beta not. Uh, and this is going to determine creators participation constraint on the platform. And because we have this participation constraint, they're going to get uh, at least weekly higher exclusive content revenue. And then there's also gonna be a change in design because the argument that maximizes this is not necessarily equal to the argument that maximizes this. Um, and if we hold R constant, uh, in fact, we are going to have more niche content or creators are gonna decrease the broadness of their content design with a hybrid platform. Um, and so we're going to end up with fewer consumers visiting the platform because Lambda H is gonna be lower than Lambda D. Uh, in terms of comparing profit, uh, a pure discovery platform has more consumers visiting. So uh, this G here is greater than G here, but a hybrid platform has this additional revenue source uh, that they get by taking the commission on exclusive content revenue, uh, which uh, would seem to be ambiguous. However, our first main result is that operating in hybrid mode is always more profitable for a platform than operating in pure discovery mode. And you're always going to get, uh, well, weekly niche content uh, than a pure discovery platform. Um, and so the, the main uh, argument here is profit replication uh, argument. So uh, the platform can always set tau equal to one minus beta naught over beta, in which case uh, the creators are getting the same expected revenue from exclusive content than they would, that they would uh, on their own. And that's gonna induce the same design. Uh, and so, you have the same participation in that case, plus this additional revenue, so you get greater profit. Can I, can I ask a, a quick question? Um, so I'm, I'm probably missing something, but isn't that the case that you always want to uh, make the constraint binding? Uh, not necessarily. Okay. Um, so, so remember you have this trade-off where you are decreasing consumer participation, but you're also increasing this margin. So by, by charging, by increasing your fee tau, uh, what is the impact on consumers? Uh, increasing tau is going to lead to broader content. Oh, sorry. Um, increasing tau is going to lead to broader uh, content, okay. which means that you increase participation, but remember that V is decreasing. Uh, and so, the, the, so tau, tau plays affects the, the kind of content and that's why you may not want to. Yes. To, to, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, and in fact, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so the fact that we get uh, more niche content or less broad content is, uh, Partly the fact that consumers are um, getting more exclusive content revenue um, and partly due to the fact that the uh, platform is also going to set a weekly less sensitive recommendations uh, system. So their R is gonna be lower than the R that a peer discovery platform would set. Uh, if we compare a pure membership platform to a hybrid platform, uh, the main differences are in terms of design are going to be the fact that uh, the design is going to be maximizing a function that has less advertising revenue, um, but also no competition for creators in a pure 
membership set uh, case. So um, going from pure membership to hybrid is going to induce this competition for recommendation. It's going to lead to higher ad revenue. Uh, and for searchers, it's also going to decrease search costs. So even if uh, content design were unchanged, you would have an increase in consumer participation. Uh, this is, these factors are going to lead creators to increase the broadness of their content design. So you're gonna have less niche content design for a constant tau. Um, so overall, you're gonna have more consumer participation because of uh, increase in Lambda and a decrease in the search cost. Uh, the profit comparison here is not necessarily uh, going to go in favor of one or the other, however. So you have this increased participation and you have this advertising revenue, but again, you're decreasing V. So you're decreasing this margin. Uh, for any given tau. So our second main result is that a hybrid platform is going to be more profitable than a, a pure membership platform if this advertising revenue is greater than some threshold. And the reasoning here is what we're calling a distraction effect. So because creators are going to choose broader design for any given tau due to the recommendation competition for recommendation and their increase in ad revenue, uh, the platform might not be able to induce its desired content design. And so adding a discovery portable, portal can be unprofitable if A here is fairly small. So if the platform is relying heavily on its transaction commission, it can actually hurt more than it helps. Uh, and there's a, real, a really nice real world example of this. So in 2019, Patreon published a uh, blog post labeled, why isn't Patreon a discovery platform? And they argued that adding a discovery component would force creators to design content to appeal to whatever discovery algorithm they would introduce, which they described as getting in between creators and patrons. Uh, and then they went on to focus how, on how they want their business to focus on high value relationships with small audiences, as opposed to having a very large audience with many low value viewers. Uh, and this is actually exactly the trade-off being described by our model. Uh, and so if a platform's revenue is transaction focused, then adding this discovery portal can actually hurt more than it helps. Uh, so going from uh, peer membership, to a uh, hybrid platform can also have an ambiguous effect on content design. So again, if the commission were fixed, then you would have broader content with a hybrid platform. But a hybrid platform could theoretically choose a lower commission, partly because of the increased ad revenue, meaning that for any given commission, uh, this is higher and the platform might want a lower content design but also because you're gonna have increased consumer particip participation regardless. Uh, and this lower tau means that you might end up having more niche content uh, with a hybrid platform. And the plat hybrid platform is going to want niche design if A is sufficiently small because it doesn't need to work as hard to encourage consumer participation. Uh, and it wants to maximize that membership revenue. So our result on content design here is that uh, you're going to get broader content with a hybrid platform if this capital A is greater than some threshold. Uh, and then for all three modes, um, the content, the broadness of content is going to at least weekly decrease as consumer search costs decrease, uh, which sounds reminiscent of the Bar Isaac et al. search results in AER. Um, but in our setup, search costs don't actually have a direct effect on creators' design. Uh, what we have is this, uh, fact, this uh, factor that I was describing before. You have lower search costs, meaning more visiting consumers um, for any given design. And the platform is going to choose its recommendation scheme and commission 
to induce more niche content design because they don't have to encourage consumers to visit as much. All right, so that's the monopoly benchmark. What happens if you have multiple platforms? Uh, so we start with a model where we have two homogenous platforms. Each content creator is gonna make a single content design decision, um, but they are going to be able to mix and match in participation decisions. So uh, as a content creator, I could participate on the uh, discovery portal of one platform and the membership portal of a different platform freely. Uh, and you can also, uh, consumers and creators can also freely multi-home. Uh, the timing of the model is going to start with uh, platforms acting simultaneously. So similar to the monopoly benchmark, it starts with choosing mode of operation, uh, which the platforms are going to do simultaneously. And then they are also going to make their decisions for recommendation sensitivity and commissions simultaneously. In the equilibrium of the consumer creator sub game, creators are going to join both discovery portals, essentially because it's costless to do so. They're going to join the membership portal that has the lowest commission and consumers are going to search on the discovery portal that is most sensitive to broad content. And they're gonna join the membership portal of their matched creator. Uh, so our main result here is that when a competing platform strategy includes a membership portal, it is never a best response to operate a competing membership portal. So if we compare this to the monopoly case, going from pure discovery to hybrid is actually uh, unprofitable. It's not just uh, weakly unprofitable, it's strictly unprofitable if the opponent operates a membership portal. And the reason here is that because we have homogenous membership portals, we have a uh, lot of competition and therefore a low exclusive content commission. So platforms are gonna be relying mostly on ad revenue and this competition in commission is going to lead to a negative spillover onto ad revenue. Uh, and the mechanism is you have a low commission which leads to creators choosing a more niche design which means you're gonna have fewer visiting consumers and therefore lower total ad revenue than you would if you just had a, uh, say a pure membership and a pure discovery portal. Uh, and then for other main results in the multiple platform section, uh, Suppose operating a discovery portal involves a fixed cost C, which is actually something that we have been assuming throughout the entire paper. It just didn't make much of a substantial difference until now. Uh, so in the overall equilibrium with this fixed cost, there's gonna be a threshold such that if A is less than this threshold in equilibrium, you have one platform operating in pure discovery mode and one platform operating in pure membership mode. And if A is greater than that threshold, uh, you have one platform operating in pure discovery mode and one platform operating in hybrid mode. Now this is not actually gonna be due to the distraction effect. Um, so we can think of this distraction effect as being absent or in another sense, it's kind of always there. Because we have a pure discovery portal, no matter what, there's always going to be uh, a recommendation system that has some sensitivity to uh, content creators design and content creators advertising revenue is always going to be higher than a not. Um, and so whether uh, this platform over on the right here decides to include a discovery portal doesn't change content creators design. It's really comparing this fixed cost to the ad revenue they would get in equilibrium. So if capital A divided by two is greater than C, uh, a platform might as well add a discovery portal. Uh, so we also have a few extensions that we've gone through. Um, the main one where we have some results changing is with horizontally differentiated platforms. 
Uh, so if you have horizontally differentiated membership portals, then you can actually end up with multiple membership portals in equilibrium. Uh, but a lot of our main intuition survives this extension. Um, if we allow for asymmetric creators and elastic creator participation, our results survive essentially unchanged. And then uh, as a work in progress, we're working on endogenizing advertising revenue for both creators and the platform. Uh, there is a pretty nice related literature here. Uh, so there's a robust literature on media platforms. Um, most of this literature uh, is relating to uh, platforms that are intermediating between consumers and advertisers. Uh, for this paper, we're mainly focusing on intermediation between content creators and advertisers. Sorry, content creators and consumers. Um, and content creators are essentially users. So this obviously means that we have a relationship to the user generated content literature. Um, most of this literature is focused on uh, the behavior of users who are generating content. Um, our focus here is more on the business models of a platform and this idea of direct monetization of users. Um, so Pay and Maislin, for example, are thinking about a advertiser funded uh, influencer. Um, and of course, this business model uh, focus means that we're related to the literature that's looking at business models of media platform, um, including this excellent paper right here. Um, our focus difference, different, uh, is different from most of this literature because we're interested in this membership component of the platform. Um, so most of this literature has focused on pay TV versus ad supported TV. Uh, and uh, there's some other papers that are related, um, particularly uh, some interest, uh, interesting relationship to the crowdfunding literature. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, didn't get uh, as many clarifying questions as I had built in time for. So uh, Panar, I guess you have a little extra time. Um, we create a model that is looking at the implications of business model decisions by platforms for the content creation market. And we build a model that has endogenous content designed by creators along a broad niche axis. Uh, we allow our platform to form a recommendation scheme, set a commission, uh, and it receives ad revenue. Going from pure discovery mode to hybrid mode is always profitable for a monopoly platform. It's going to be unprofitable if an undifferentiated rival membership portal exists because of this negative spillover effect on advertising revenue. And it's going to make equilibrium content design more niche than you would have with a pure discovery portal. Going from pure membership mode to hybrid mode is going to create a distraction effect that means it may be unprofitable for a monopoly platform to operate a, a membership portal, sorry, a discovery portal. But this distraction effect is going to be irrelevant if a rival discovery portal exists. And because of the distraction effect, the effect on equilibrium content design is also going to be somewhat ambiguous. And then if we have multiple platforms that can lead to strategic differentiation in business models uh, in order to avoid direct competition. Uh, thank you. Right, thanks Ben. Um, can you unshare your screen please? And uh, now Pina Ildirim will uh, discuss uh, the paper. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for uh, including me in the program. And, and thanks to Ben and Pat for uh, writing and sharing this very interesting, thought-provoking paper. Um, I thought that I would try to put this paper in the intuition or the way that I would, uh, I would think about the, the problem. And I actually have worked on um, related problems. So I'm just going to think about 
or, or, or try to explain the paper in the way that I understand. Um, and the way that I think about this paper is looking at a very close literature, which actually leads to goes back to the media bias literature. In this particular um, literature, we think about media bias or the extent of um, extremism that media platforms might choose as a way of differentiation, especially in a competing market. And um, looking at, for instance, the Nathan and Schleifer paper from 2005, the, the AER paper, this, is, uh, this paper is thinking about a newspaper competition where the media outlets can choose political bias as a form of differentiation. And consumers desire some degree of confirmation bias in this market. And then the newspapers only make revenue from subscription. That is a push for differentiation, right? It's uh, something that increases willingness to to pay of the consumer if you can differentiate your content and it acts as a force of maximum differentiation in this market. Now, in a follow-up paper, actually, we thought about with my co-authors um, how the, the, the product differentiation and uh, competition in this market would change if newspapers were to make revenues from advertising as opposed to subscription or if there was a combination of the two. And that you can see already that the, the motivation to differentiate will look very different, especially in a market where advertisers are looking for eyeballs. What you want to deliver to advertisers is simply broader methods, larger audiences, right? Compared to the previous force of trying to extract surplus through the increasing the willingness to pay of the consumer when you're operating in a subscription market, or with subscription advertiser uh, with revenues. With advertisers, you have the, the opposite effect. Bigger readership can command higher advertising revenues. As a result, you're going to differentiate, differentiate less and you're going to uh, simply reduce media bias in this market. With, you will end up with lower subscription fees and that's also in turn going to reflect onto your advertising revenues. As uh, you're trying to deliver simply larger masses and reduce differentiation and end up um, you know, changing your, your subscription fees, in turn, you also have to adjust your advertising fees. But um, you know, long story short, by looking already at the media bias and media differentiation literature and comparing subscription and advertising revenues, we know that there are two forces in place. One is trying to, to maximize the willingness to pay of the consumer through subscription. When you are operating under subscription, you want to do that. When you have advertising and when you're delivering eyeballs to advertisers, as opposed to other forms of advertising, you want to maximize readership. And that means differentiation, uh, reducing differentiation. So I think about this paper or the three modes of operation as uh, uh, you know, having a lot of parallels to this earlier literature. Discovery platforms in this case are simply to me, advertising revenue generating platforms. So as a result, these platforms will want to generate broader content, right? Generate more recommendations, more eyeballs and higher revenue as a result. Membership platforms on the other hand, operate more like a subscription revenue platform. And for them, the objective is to deliver higher willingness to pay of the consumer or provide products that are closer to their preferences. And a hybrid will be a combination of advertising and subscription. And of course it might be uh, you know, um, uh, profitable or not. Um, quickly, now I think what's interesting about this paper are a few things. First, it's adding to this existing literature, the idea of recommendation systems, right? Or how do recommendation systems could potentially alter your revenues from advertising and subscription. It's also thinking about um, these, these asymmetric movements from subscription to hybrid or advertising revenue to hybrid. And just to put the, the intuition the way that I understand it, uh, thinking about adding subscription revenues to a platform that already operates under advertising, now it actually is changing from the platform's perspective. It, it relaxes the competition uh, to make recommendations or it actually, you know, being able to generate revenues from subscription simply allows you to also, also recommend content that's not broad because broad content is for advertisers. Now I can also, I have an incentive to recommend niche uh, creators and, and niche content. So this is almost a source of additional revenue. As a result, they find that the hybrid profits are higher than just operating under advertising. But this is not necessarily the case. If you look at the movement from the asymmetric side, right? Just having subscription and adding advertising revenue on top of it doesn't necessarily mean higher profits. Um, in this case, you can think of the two effects that are happening, right? First, from the content provider's perspective, when you add 
give them advertising, the opportunities to earn advertising revenue on top of subscription, now they have an incentive to create broader content. But at the same time, you know, uh, this broader content reduces the ability to extract the fees from uh, subscription uh, prices from the consumer. So one positive, one negative effect. Overall, the, the, uh, the profit, the effect on the profit is ambiguous. So, and the relative benefits of one advertising versus subscription is actually to some extent under the control of the, the platform as it sets its commissions, the TAU commission rates, as well as R. Uh, but uh, ultimately, it seems like all of the benefits are actually defined by some of these assumptions that are set by the, the authors with respect to how, as you go from advertising to subscription to hybrid, the advertising revenue, the potential for additional advertising revenue or the potential for additional uh, subscription revenue, which actually is captured by the beta, um, are, are changing. So these, these assumptions drive uh, whether you can make more money from one versus the other. And I think it also adds another additional interesting finding looking at the, the competitive case and showing that, that, of course, you know, in a competitive case, if you only operate through subscription, you are now going to, to reduce your ability to extract surplus because your tell, you, you have to set tell competitively. At the same time, if you're competing under just advertising profits, you're going to have to compete for creators and that's also going to re reduce or limit your ability to, to earn revenues from advertising. But an asymmetric competition of the two where one platform is differentiating in business model and operating under subscription and the other one under advertising might actually become more profitable. And I think this is one of the, the fairly uh, you know, new and, and more interesting findings of this paper. Um, so I think I briefly mentioned what's novel. To me, what's novel about this paper compared to the existing comparisons of advertising subscription business models is a recommendation plot, uh, engine or recommendation platform. And I think this can be pushed further. I will talk about that a little bit. The choice of uh, revenue sources under competition, right? This asymmetric choice. And the fact that there could be different incentives to move from you know, your existing business model, advertising or subscription to hybrid. You know, movement is not necessarily profitable for both. They, there's some asymmetry with regards to whether it's profitable. Now, a um, couple of recommendations <laughs> or a couple sort of thoughts on the paper. I thought that's actually the recommendation links are fairly interesting and that's an underlooked area, how the revenue model of a firm, of a, of a platform might be influencing its recommendations, the content of the recommendations. And I thought a, a simple example of this could be newspapers, right? Some newspapers operate under advertising revenue and others operate under subscription revenue and they almost always make recommendations for consumers to, to consume additional other content, just like in, in Wall Street Journal. And Maybe you know the content of these recommendations might be a lot, uh, a lot broader subjects or a lot more niche subjects depending on the revenue. And I don't know if this is true, if there's any empirical support of it. But the findings or the the um, the paper that Ben and Pat has written would suggest that there should be some differences in the content of what's recommended based on the business model. And I think this can be pushed further. I don't think that the paper is currently <laughs> doing enough uh, to push this. And, and this would be a very interesting extension, even a paper on its own. A second thing to think about is advertising revenue. In this paper, as well as you know, in my, some of my recent papers as well, advertising revenue is captured um, is simply serving eyeballs to the advertisers. But that's actually just a, a very small, perhaps an, an, an increasing, uh, sorry, declining share of the market. More of the examples that we see today are of course targeted advertising. And targeted advertising acts closer to subscription revenue than advertising revenue because you're not delivering eyeballs, you're de delivering a niche audience. In that sense, you know, if you think of targeted advertising, this is not going to have the same effect. It's not going to, the platforms that operate through targeted advertising are not going to show the same effect. In fact, uh, you know, advertising and subscription revenue might act in exactly the same direction. Um, unlike what has been shown here. And it's going to have a very different effect in terms of competition for the creators as well. Um, a second, a third thought perhaps, a multi-homing of the, the creators and consumers. Now multi-homing is mentioned in a few places in the paper, but it hasn't really been implemented in the model from what I can see because 
A, the creators can independently, right? They actually choose between the modes. They don't necessarily make a decision thinking about a combination of the modes. They, they could, for, for instance, make less advertising revenue in, in order to get more subscription by revenue, but they don't do that. A second thing is consumers are only paying to one platform. What I know from my own paper is this figure comes from <laughs> that earlier paper that I mentioned. The multi-homing choice or allowing multi-homing could change results drastically. And I think this is going to be the case here. This is just a, an idea for thought for further exploration, thinking about how allowing the creators or consumers to multi-home would change the results. And one final thing, perhaps a, a small detail, I found in the, and I know this is a working paper, so you'll be <laughs> changing the paper quite a bit, I imagine, but I found that in many parts of the, the model, um, the assumptions regarding the parameters, for instance, the G, the D, they were not necessarily tied to the remaining parameters of the model. They were changing in ways, but you couldn't link exactly how they were changing regarding the, the, the parameters such as tau and, and V or, or alpha, beta, and so on. And I would like to see how they actually change together um, because if some of these things are endogenized, competition, especially when these parameters are endogenized, it gets very quickly, very messy. And being able to study this asymmetric revenue model might become either infeasible or it might actually generate different results, I believe. So um, that was one other thing to think about. Overall though, I thought that this paper was quite interesting. It allowed me to think about new ideas and I look forward to seeing the complete version. Thank you.